Good evening, everyone, and uh, and welcome to our little uh, talk about um, rules and safety for the ICEHQ Adult Development Program. Um, it's good to see that there's a whole heap of you uh, participating. We're also recording this session, so um, as a result, we need to cut down on the swearing a little bit and behave ourselves. But uh, just so you all know, uh, I, I do encourage you to interrupt and ask questions, and there'll be stages when we're going through this uh, this discussion where I will pause and hopefully one or two of you will pipe up. Please feel free to ask questions at any point. Uh, we've got a bunch of slides that we're going to go through as kind of guides, but uh, essentially, really, they're just uh, pointers for us to go off in tangents and discuss anything that crops up. And they're really just there to make sure that I cover all the things that mainly we need to look at. Uh, we'll be at this for probably around about an hour, give or take. At some point, my dog may decide she wants to come inside, so I'll have to go and let her. She's an Alaskan Malamute, and we don't need all the neighbours hearing the song of her people because she's pretty raucous when she wants to get in. Um, are you all seeing the images all right? Yep, all good. Cool, excellent. Uh, we'll just yep. make a slideshow. It's basically a PDF that I knocked up with some fairly badly formatted images. It's not uh, the most slick of, uh, of things, but all the same. Uh, and hopefully also you can, well, maybe hopefully or maybe hopefully not, We've got a uh, video of you guys as well. If you want to, certainly feel free to connect your video cameras as well as your microphones. Um, but if, you don't, if you're not talking, please do keep them off. Uh, we've got 17 of us at the moment, so we can have a bit of a cacophony if we don't um, kind of keep everything on mute unless we're actually specifically wanting to say something. Um, those of you who don't know me, my name is Carl Brewer. I'm the head coach of the ISHQ Adult Development Squad, which is the this season, it's there's two teams, the Ice HQ Moondog Mac Daddies and Moondog Hazies. They're called Moondog because Moondog is the brewery uh, that's sponsoring the two teams for this season. Um, they provide you know, beer and so forth. You get a beer at the end of each game if, if you drink beer. And if you don't drink beer, uh, there's soft drink and so forth as well up in the bar. So you, you get a free drink after every game, which is not bad. <laughs> um, I don't drink, so <laughs> it's a bit of a waste. But uh, you can always steal one if you ask nicely. Staff don't actually get them anyway. Um, so, you know, uh, Jane and I are both volunteers. And so is our assistant coach for this season, who is Neil. Uh, oh, golly, I forgot his surname. But anyway, Neil, you'll, you'll get to know him. He was at the training session on Saturday as well. All right, maybe this thing's going to have itself. Here we go. Um, first thing, rules. The first rule that's really important, referees really come down on this pretty hard is stoppages. If a referee blows a whistle, you're required to stop straight away. Don't keep playing. Basically ignore the puck. Don't be nice and pass it to them or anything like that. Just, just leave the puck, let the referees deal with it. It's up to them. They don't expect you to get it for them. Especially at C grade level, you may see elite players uh, in the NHL and so forth, picking the puck up with their stick and tossing it to the referees. Don't do that. <laughs> it doesn't end well. Um, the referees will be really strict on it. Uh, it is a safety issue, especially around the goal mouth. You, you can imagine you know, you've tried to shoot a goal or you're trying to defend your goal and the goalie's down kind of sprawled around over the top of the puck. And they're quite vulnerable in that position. Uh, don't keep hacking away at them, especially if the whistle blows. And it is it is quite a, quite a dangerous situation for them. Uh, I, I don't know if Lily or um, have you got any goalies here? No, no goalies. Uh, goalies are particularly vulnerable. Uh, I'm personally a bit of a, a bit of a fan of even if the whistle hasn't blown, of if you can see that the goalie's in a vulnerable position, don't go hacking away with your stick. Uh, it's, I mean, it's just dangerous, and and we goalies are pretty precious to us. They're always one of the, the hardest things places for us to fill, which is not not mo purely motivated by selfishness. To make sure that they don't um, get hurt. Essentially, we want to. Just basically protect them. So if there is a goalie sprawling around the park, even if the whistle hasn't blown, be nice to them. Don't go whacking away at their hands with a stick. But yeah, if the referee blows a whistle, you, you have to stop immediately. Doesn't mean freeze your position, but it means stop playing the puck. Don't pass it, shoot it, whatever. Uh, you can get quite a bit of penalty for it. Um, the other thing that, that may surprise some of you is that the Ice HQ Hockey Beer League is not non-contact. It's non-checking. Um, do any of you know what that means? Uh, 
I'll say a clarification would be handy. Okay. Um, well, if, 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 have any of you played basketball? Yes. Is basketball non-contact? No. No, but it's non-tackling, isn't it? Correct. If to pick someone up and drop them on the head or anything like that, or deliberately run into them. There are some quite rigor. There are some quite uh, just uh, interesting rules in basketball about contact, but it's not a non-contact sport. And ice hockey at in the, at the ice age QB league is also a non-checking, not a non-contact. And you can kind of think about checking as being a little bit like tackling. That said, we confuse you by using some terms like forecheck and backcheck, implying that you're making contact with someone to separate from, separate them from the puck. Basically, what a check means in the context of hockey is, is it's effectively like a tackle in football or, um, or, or, or rugby or something like that, where your intention is to separate the player from the puck. You're not allowed to do that in hockey, and there are some quite in, in 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 the hockey that we play at B League. But it doesn't mean there's no contact. Uh, you're allowed to hold your ground if someone runs into you. You don't have to get out of their way. Um, if two of you are contesting the puck, skating in opposite directions towards it, you're allowed to run into each other. Um, things like that. What you're not, you are also allowed to shield the puck from your body. So, have any of you played field hockey? Yes. Yeah. Yes. You know with field hockey, you're not allowed to put your body between the ball and the opposition. Yep. That's not the same in ice hockey. You can. In ice hockey, you can shield the puck. You can put your body between uh, the puck and and your opponents, uh, and you can do all those sorts of things. Which in field hockey, you're not allowed to do. So the two games in that in that respect are very very different. I, I tried to play field hockey once, and it didn't it didn't last very long. Uh, I'm not sure if it was a send-off or a penalty or something rather, but they kept saying you can't do that. I'm like, well, what do you mean I can't do this? It's just silly. Um, but yeah, the, the rules for field hockey about um, contact are completely different to ice. Um, so you're you're allowed to make contact. Uh, you're just not allowed to deliberately separate your opponent from the puck unless your intention is to play the puck. And we'll go into that a little bit later. There's some some rules about it. There will be collisions. Um, there's also allowed to be what's called fair push and shove, especially if you're in the area in front of the goal. So much like basketball, you know, there's contested space under the net in basketball. Any basketballers? Anyone played basketball? Yes. You know how underneath the net, there's a bit of contest for, for position and you're allowed to kind of be a bit physically assertive. There's a certain amount of leeway about contact in that area underneath the net in basketball. It's the same in hockey. You're allowed a, a little bit of push and shove and a bit of contest in front of the net, um, in front in front of the goal area. You're not allowed into the blue goalie's crease. That's um, that's a protected area. So if you go skating through the through the crease, through the crease, you're going to get in trouble. Um, but you are allowed uh, to in front of that area that we call the slot, which is the area basically in front of the net. And I'll just pull up a a um, um, rink diagram so I can kind of sketch on it and you can see. So just bear with me for a sec while I change the share. This is one thing about Zoom that I always find a bit clunky. I've done far too much Zoom over the last couple of years, as I'm sure we all have. Um, can you all see the rink all right? Yeah. 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 So if we're defending the goal at the bottom of the screen, the area called the slot, roughly speaking, is that area there. It's where goals get scored. Or where if you if you're going to score a goal, it's where you want to be. It's also where you're going to get some assertion for position. Um, bearing that in mind, and and that you can have a can have a bit of push and shove. I'm just going to show you a video of something which can be illegal sometimes and sometimes isn't, and it kind of depends a little bit on who's doing what. So I'll pop up a video. This is from a game in B3, which is a grade a little bit above you guys at the moment at ISO at ISO HQ. But I want to just show you. You watch in front of the net, there's, there's a guy in a white jersey, that's, that's me, <laughs> and there's a guy in a red jersey, and this is what happens. All right, you all saw that? Yeah. We can watch it again if you're not sure. So right in front of the net. Just a bit of a push to establish some space. It wasn't a cross check. There was no stick in the back of the numbers or anything like that. 
But in that area, you are allowed to do a little bit of pushing and a little bit of shoving in order to get yourself a little bit of space. If you overdo it, you'll get a penalty, but you're allowed a little bit. Now, something to be mindful of in C2 in particular is you're all beginners. Correct me if I'm wrong. And the sort of push that I just gave JT there in the back, down low on his hips, if you did that in C2, you're probably going to send someone sprawling and then you'll get a penalty. So you've got to kind of think, who am I playing against and what level of contact and, and physical assertion is appropriate for, for my opposition? If, if you can see, say, for example, you're one of the better skaters in the grade and you're skating up towards the boards, you can see someone that you're skating towards is a bit shaky on their feet. Don't barrel them over. Um, it's only a game of hockey. Keep it real. Make sure that you give them a bit of distance and back off a little bit. We all want to go to work again tomorrow and no one wants to get hurt. And it's pretty easy to get hurt playing hockey if you're not careful. Okay? We're going to look after each other. At least we're going to try to. So the overarching principle, principle is always player safety. It's not the NHL. No fights, please. If you get involved in fights and you start it, you, you're out of our program. I will personally kick you out. <laughs> if we don't have it, it's not on. All right? It's not the NHL. Got it? All right. So the, the actual the rule about contact is in the rule book, and it's uh, the International Ice Hockey Federation Rule 101. I'm not going to read that out to you. It's kind of pointless. You can read it on your own time. That basically explains what you're allowed to do in kind of legalese, which is a bit hard to read. It's called the women's rule because in, under the International Hockey Federation, International Ice Hockey Federation system, the men's hockey at elite level is, is full contact, similar to but not exactly the same as the NHL. Uh, and the, the women's competition is non-checking, so basically the rule that we're using. Um, personally, I think that's pretty disappointing that women aren't allowed to play under the same rules as the men. Uh, they're allowed to just about everything in, else women are allowed to box, they're allowed to do mixed martial arts and all those other stupid things. But, but they're not allowed to play full contact ice hockey, which I, I can't change that. I've been working on that for a long time to try and at least get parity, but that's what it is. So that kind of explains what the rule is. If you want to read through it in detail, you can. Um, there's a link later on in the slideshow, and I'll also put it up on the Facebook page um, with a link through to the International Ice Hockey Federation rulebook, which is a PDF you can download for free. And if you struggle to sleep, it's a good read to put you to sleep. <laughs> it's... It's um, not the most exciting of books, but anyway, that's that's how it works. Um, you're also not allowed to shepherd like you can in games like, for example, Australian rules football. Uh, we do see it at times, skaters deliberately skating across in front of someone else to get in their way. Sometimes it's a bit of a line call, but if it's really blatant and the referees see it, you'll get a two-minute penalty. Um, so you're not allowed to basically interfere with someone else's progress. Again, those interference rules, they're a little bit relaxed in front of the goal mouth when you're in the slot position. That's where you can have a little bit of push and shove. But if we're skating along, chasing the puck, I can kind of put myself between you and the puck, but I'm not allowed to block your progress towards another player, at least not overtly. If it happens accidentally because I'm going somewhere and you're going somewhere and I get in your way, that's just the way it goes. Uh, but if I'm deliberately obstructing someone by skating in front of them and changing direction, uh, I'll, I'll get penalised for that. Okay? It gets more interesting, I promise. All right, equipment. If you break a stick, drop it. Seems kind of weird, doesn't it? Why do you think that might be? Becomes a weapon? Yeah, it's pretty dangerous. Um, I mean, Sharp, pointy sticks roaming around the, the rink is not a good idea. Well, but they end up on the ice, which is arguably just as dangerous, depending on how well you can skate. I'm going to show you a video now, and this is from a Ducks versus Coast game in the in a Pacific League last year. Um, and you'll see an example of this exactly, exactly happening. So just stand by for a second while I shuffle things. We'll probably watch this once or twice, just so you can see what happens. Box for that for that first goal again. Drill Nick now protecting the puck, still with it on the half wall, drops it for McMahon. Nice little slapper there, probably stand on it a bit. Stick. Allows Kusilov to get it, but he chips that up for his for Ivan. But a uh, nice poke check there by Davis finds finds Drill Nick. That was a bit of my broken stick, and you might not have noticed it in the side play, but he picked up a new stick straight past 
It's back back to uh, shut down that attack as well. So yeah. really good. Oh, intercepted there by Dimitri to support his team after being in the penalty box for that, for that first goal again. Brillnick now protecting the puck. Still with it on the half wall. Drops it for McMahon. Nice little slap. All right. So what's Michael McMahon done as soon as he's noticed that he's dropped his, his broken stick? Dropped it. Yeah, it's just immediately dropped it. Seems kind of weird. Like I'm just throwing this thing onto the ice. Like I feel bad for littering. <laughs> but the referees will sort it out. It's not your problem. Uh, if you do continue to carry around a broken stick, you will get penalised. Uh, so don't take it across to the bench and drop it off or anything like that. Just drop it. Um, it's considered to be a weapon uh, and broken equipment has to be immediately basically dropped on the surface of the ice and effectively abandoned. Um, once they're busted, they're not very much use anyway. You can make tables and people have done all sorts of things with making little hockey sticks, but they usually break down at the blade if they are going to break. Although these days it's pretty rare. Um, you can usually spot the old timers at the hockey rink because we bring two or three sticks to every game just out of habit because uh, we used to break them fairly regularly, but the modern carbon sticks, they, they're they pretty resilient. They don't tend to break very often. You might see a break once every, once a week, perhaps, at the rink, which is pretty good, but it used to be more like once a game in the old days. Um, so, yeah, don't, if you drop a stick, um, what you can do is you can then go and pick up another one, uh, or you can continue to play without a stick. Now, depending on what you're doing, that might be a good situation. Under what circumstances is it, is it good to continue to play without a stick, do you think? Defense. If you're playing defence, trying to stop them, just get in their way, try and yep. just be a nuisance. Yep. You know, use your feet. Because um, you can use your feet. Another thing different to... Um, different to... Oops, what just happened there? Long screen. Sorry, I'm trying to sit back. Um, I want to... That one. Um, yeah, if you, if you you can use your feet to kick a puck, uh, and so you know you're not totally useless without a stick. Although generally the best idea is to do what? Run to the bench and grab another. Or swap out. Yeah, get a change. Chances are you don't have a spare stick, and if you do, it might take a while to find it. Um, so you're better off just getting a change. If you've come over to the bench. Certainly in C2 or C1 or pretty much most of the grades below about A grade, no one's going to be holding out a stick for you to pick it up. Um, we're not playing lines. We're playing individual positions. So just get a change. It's going to be more going to be easier to deal with. Um, and then you know, find, get, get your spare stick if you've got one. Uh, or if not, you may need to organise a spare from the rink if we have one sitting around, something like that. It's going to take a bit of time to sort it out. Um, but yeah, broken stick, drop it. Helmets have to be hockey specific. At one point, there was a couple of players skating around in lacrosse helmets. Not allowed. Um, they're different. Uh, ice hockey helmets are specifically designed for ice hockey. The ones that you can borrow from the rink are ice hockey helmets, not surprisingly. If you have your own, it has to be a specific ice hockey stick. It has to be a specific ice hockey helmet. Not only that, you have to have a visor. In the old days, you didn't. Um, but you have to have a visor, and it has to go down to the, the tip of your nose at, at, as a minimum. Um, the, there are also uh, the, 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 the helmets that are lent out by the rink, uh, full cage. Uh, and you can buy full cages or you can buy another one, that thing called a, gold, a goldfish bowl, which is like a perspex eye thing with a, with a mouth guard down below. Um, uniquely for Ice HQ, we don't require that women wear full face cages. If you want to wear a visor, you can. Um, because that's the same rules for the boys. And I think that's fair enough. We don't recommend it. We recommend that you wear a full full visor or a full or a fishbowl. Uh, anyone who's seen me skate, they'll notice that I don't. I'm one of those old school idiots that considers their jaw to be a crumple zone. Uh, it's a recommendation that you have a full cage, but it's not a requirement. You can use just a visor if you want, and it's your decision, whether or not, irrespective of your gender. Um, we, we try as much as possible to make things be... Same for the boys and the girls. Um, if you are going to use a visor, use a mouth guard. You can keep it in your mouth. There's a photo there you can see of uh, Hayden Dawes. <laughs> he used to skate around with his mouth guard poking out of his mouth all the time. I'm not quite sure why he bothered with the mouth guard because he never had it in his mouth at all. Uh, it was like some sort of a chewing gum slash cigar thing. I think you might have thought he was Arnold Schwarzenegger in a 1980s movie with his cigar hanging out of his mouth or something or other. But anyway, uh, if you're going gonna to use a mouth guard, Keep it in your mouth. No one needs to see it. It's not where you want it. Uh, equipment also needs to be secure and well-maintained. Things like helmets, the straps have to be done up. 
um, gloves need to be intact, those sorts of things. And that there, not only is that a safe is that a safety thing, but it also affects how you play. Uh, how distracting is it if your shin guards are moving around on your legs? Very. It's pretty annoying. If your equipment's not set up right, adjusted right, and secure, it's going to distract you from playing the game. And this game's hard enough. You're learning to skate. You're learning to understand the game of hockey. There's a lot of movement, a lot of chaos. The last thing you want is your equipment letting you down as well. So if you're using borrowed equipment, as soon as you can get your own, um, it doesn't have to be top of the range stuff. Get the best gear you can afford because it does make a difference. Um, we've got a, a, a recommended list of order of which to get stuff in as well, which is in the um, handout, which hopefully you'll get a copy of. Uh, if not, there's a link to it on the um, Development Squad Facebook page so you can see all that as well. Um, but make sure it's secure, make sure it's well maintained. Wash the stuff, right? When you finish, take your jerseys home, wash them, take your gear, wash it, clean it. Spend 20 works, it's expensive. You can make up your own mix with isopropyl alcohol. We've all been mucking around with our home brew disinfectants over the last few years. Um, keep your stuff clean. You don't want to be opening up your bag in your change room and everyone else running out because you've invented some new form of life. We don't need that. Look after it. It'll look. It'll last a lot longer as well. All right. Some other stuff about rules. Actually, did I do high sticking? Let me just. I'm going to go. I'm going to show you some stuff about high sticking as well. Um, have you ever? Has anyone heard of high sticking? Yeah. Have a guess at what it is. Pretty, it's pretty obvious. Lift your stick too high in a dangerous position. Yeah. Exactly. Um, again, another picture to show you more of an example of it. All right, that's that's a high stick. <laughs> Poor old um, Brody Lindell there is, is about to cop one in the ear from one of the Adelaide players. That was in a, um, it, it would have got a two minute penalty for that as a minimum. Uh, sometimes it's unintentional. In fact, a lot of time it is unintentional. That guy certainly wasn't trying to whack Brody in the head. Um, and, and it happens to some of us sometimes as well. So if you do get a whack in the head from a stick, don't automatically turn around and assume someone's done it to you deliberately. They probably didn't mean it. Um, often a stick gets flicked up by someone else's stick or just basically mishandling uh, and it can get flicked up and, and, and give you a whack in the helmet. It's one of the reasons why we wear helmets. Uh, and that's a classic example of it. I'm going to show you a video of that as well. Um, so you can see it's a little bit hard to spot, but it's worthwhile because it's an unintentional high stick. If you watch on the, can you, hopefully you can see my mouse pointer moving around. I'm gonna start this video. I don't know why Zoom always does this, it's very annoying. But if you watch that number 12, I think it might be on the far right. Can you all see my mouse pointer? Yeah. I can. Watch the blade of that stick, watch what happens. All right, what just happened? Did he just trip up a little bit? He did as well. <laughs> what happened with his stick? It, it, it came up. Yeah, it did. And what, what did it do? Did it hit Lack Lisa Mack? Yeah, it hit Lisa Mack, um, who, who is a bit feisty herself. She, she scored it across the side of the helmet. And she assumed it was deliberate. It wasn't deliberate. It's just the guy couldn't skate. And he was overbalancing. And as he's overbalanced, he's trying to walk his stick around just because he's trying to stay on his feet. Uh, she happened to be in the way. Certainly didn't mean it. No one means to hit someone in the head with a stick. And if you do, <laughs> don't. Um, and then, you know, it all, it all escalates from there and the referee's arm goes up and it's a two minute penalty and, and off he goes. And, and Lisa wasn't hurt, which was good. Um, but uh, yeah, you, you can see how quickly and easily it can happen. It's entirely unintentionally. Um, another good reason to use a face cage if, you, if you're umming and ahhing about it. Uh, I think if you start off using a face cage, it's a pretty good idea. One of the reasons why some of us older guys don't is because when we started, we didn't wear them at all. And we find it, and I personally find them quite, I don't know, just restrictive. And I'm sure if you kind of got used to it, it's not such a big deal. So if you've always used one, you probably don't care. But anyway, that's, a, that's an example of a high stick. Bothering me, Zoom, just do this for me. Here we go. So, offside. Who's played soccer? Yep. Yep. Not the same. 
<laughs> that the ice hockey offside rule is designed to prevent you leaving players in the attacking zone uh, and getting past to kind of like you would kick to a full forward in Australian rules football. Right, you can't do that in in hockey. In in soccer, if you if you've seen it before, the rule is you have to have two defensive players between you and the goal line. In ice hockey, it's that doesn't make any difference. The rule is you're not allowed in the attacking zone unless the puck's in. There's a some some people call it um, puck you or puck me. So it's puck first and then you is one way to one way to try and remember it. So the offensive the attacking zone is over the blue line towards the opponent's goal. You're not allowed in that area unless the puck's gone in first. Um, if the puck comes out, everyone has to come out who is attacking before anyone can go back in. Um, I think uh, Shelley from the um, Southern Lights has done quite a nice little animation of it, which will probably pop up a link to on the Facebook page um, in the next 24 hours or so. So you can have a look at that as well. So that's that's the basics of the rule. So if the puck, you're not allowed in the attacking zone unless the puck's gone in first. And if the puck comes out, everyone has to come out before anyone can go back in. Uh, how strict is it going to be with the offside? Very strict. If I, so if I'm carrying it in, will I get called off if I entered like a meter while it was just like lacking behind? Technically, if you're in actual control of the puck, then it's not offside. Okay. But you're in C2. You're not in control of the puck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you might think you are, but the referees will know. Um, so they'll be pre pretty strictly enforced, uh, which is also for a good reason. We want you, a lot of these rules like the, uh, the offside and the icing will be strictly enforced. Uh, and that's so that you learn very quickly not to do it as you go up through the grades. Okay, so the player can, in their own defensive zone is never offside. In the neutral zone, you're never offside. You can only be offside if you're attacking. Um, and we've got a handout and some other stuff as well that you can have a look at. But if you're not sure, get out. One of the things we'll do is, and I've got a pretty loud voice, if, you, if you're on a team that I'm coaching and you're offside, me and quite possibly someone else will be barking at the top of our voices offside. And if you're in the offensive zone and you hear from the bench someone yelling out offside, have a guess at what's happened. You're probably offside. You're probably offside, absolutely. So get out <laughs> and get out as quick as you can because no one else can go in until everyone has come out. So the entire team has to come out of the attacking zone before anyone is allowed back in, which means you can't forecheck until that player's come out. So you've got to be aware of what the puck's doing and you have to move quickly in that context. We'll be yelling out, offside, offside, offside. And you're like, what, what, what? Hey, it's you, get out <laughs> quickly because no one can go in until you've until you've come out. When does the play stop when you're offside compared to just when you have to get out? When the referee blows a whistle. And does he do that because one of your players has touched the puck yes. or? Yeah. yeah. The opposition can just get playing. Yeah. The defending team can do whatever they want. Um, it's only attacking players who aren't allowed to touch the puck. If you do touch the puck, it's then called a deliberate offside and there will be a face-off in... The, at the other end's defensive zone. Uh, so, the, uh, so the defending team gets an advantage out of it. Uh, you're not allowed to score a goal when your players are offside. It used to be that you couldn't even shoot on the net. You can now, but you can't score a goal, which seems kind of silly. Um, but you can, if the puck comes out, you can put the puck back in. Everyone still has to come out, but you can put the puck back in. And that's one way. So for example, you're a defensive player. Uh, and you're around around the middle of middle of the rink, and the puck comes out, and all of your forwards are still in, and you're under pressure. You've got a bunch of opposition players coming towards you, like, oh, what am I going to do? Um, instead of stand there and do nothing and wait for them to swamp you, you can shoot the puck back into attack. You can't go in until all of your players have come out, though. Oh, yeah. Okay. So it's just a way of relieving pressure. It'll make more sense when we actually start to do it. It's a bit hard to explain just um, you know, yapping away on a, on a session like this and I kind of need to animate it. I haven't got a good animation of that yet, uh, but you can, it's called dumping the puck back in or just dumping the puck. Uh, you can dump it, dump it deep into the attacking zone, which buys you a bit of time. So if you're under pressure, dump it back in, have a scratch. <laughs> All your players come out. One of them, they then go back in again uh, and then you can 
continue to play. So it's the game only stops if you interfere with the puck while while you're in an offside position. It, it'll make sense once you start playing it. Okay. Sure. I think <laughs> this is the one that always caves everyone's head in. And it's it's, it's icing is is a funny one at ice HQ because our icing our icing rule is different, and not only is it different, it's actually different just for C two, sorry just for C grade. Um, it was different. All of the ice HQ B league icing was a was a unique rule designed to keep the game moving. Um, but it's it's been changed a bit for the higher grades. But when you're playing in C one or C two, the icing rule is reasonably simple. If you're behind the centre line, so the red line in the middle of the rink, and you shoot the puck all the way down the other end, and it crosses the goal line at the other end, it doesn't go in for a goal, but crosses the goal line, and you haven't touched it first, or no one's touched it first, you're not allowed to go past the face-off dots until the opposition has recognisable control of the puck. So I'm going to show you a video of this one, because I do have one of them. Just bear with me for a sec while I queue it up. In something. Where'd you go? There you go. I said to you, I see. So if you're the, the team in the green, right, you shoot the puck all the way in, crosses the red line, referee's arm goes up, okay, and which is them saying icing. They might also yell out icing. Sometimes they do. There's a defensive player in red going back to get it. The green player, I don't know why this is doing this again. Oh, come on, Zoom, that'd be difficult. I'm going to have to let this loop through. I don't know why Zoom insists on being so difficult. But anyway, we'll just run through this a couple of times. Very buggy piece of software, this one. Oh, why are you doing that? Oh, because the text has come up. Okay, so what you can see is the green player has stopped above the face-off dot. Can you all see that? Yeah. So it's just above the dot, not the actual yeah. hash? Or a dot or the hash marks, either one. It doesn't really matter. As long okay. as you are behind a line like that. It's not meant to be squiggly. It's meant to be a straight line, but my drawing skills are terrible. Okay, let's do it better. That's awful. Awesome. So as long as you're kind of behind a line like that, it's fine because you're not putting pressure on the other team. They've got to go get go back and get recognizable possession, which basically means touch the puck or get close enough to the puck that they could touch the puck and then stop. Because you might think, oh, I'll be smart about this. So if, if we've, we, the opposition's just iced the puck. I'll go down there and stand next to the puck and not touch it. They can't come and get me and I can just sit there and run the puck down. Can't do that. That's considered not playing the game. That's delaying the game and you'll get penalized. Um, but you can you can go there and as long as it looks like you've actually got control of the puck, the other team can then go in and it's called four checking, go in and go in and put pressure on you again. So you can see the puck, they've gone and got got possession, and then the green player can go in and put some go in and put some pressure on them. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you some examples of offside because I've actually got, I've got some reasonable videos of that. Because it is one that tends to get people a lot at, at first. So in this instance, it's a little bit contrived because the green team are on a, power, are on a penalty kill, but it makes it a little bit easier to see what's going on. All right. See how the pucks come out of the zone? What has to happen? All of the players have to come out of the offensive zone and the puck has to go in first before they re-enter. Well, let's have a look. They, they just all have to come out. The puck can go back in straight away, but everyone has to come out before anyone can go back in. It's not where the puck is at, at that point. So let's watch what happens. Right. The blue player goes back and gets the puck. All the other blue players are getting out because they know. And then they can go back in again. 
Now that's that's a penalty kill, so it's a little bit um, a little bit easier to see that, that that player wasn't getting any pressure on them. But that's an example of the puck. Everyone has to come out before anyone can go back in. I'll show you another one. Whoops. Does anyone else actually genuinely hate Zoom? <laughs> Am I the only one? All right. So what's happened here is the green, the blue team were attacking. You can see there's a green goalie down the end. So the blue team are attacking the top of the net. And that player there, number 20, let's watch it again from the start. All right. So the green team have just cleared the puck, yeah? Yes. What has to happen? All the players have to come out of the offensive zone. All of the blue players have to come out of the offensive zone, all the attacking players. But yes. So let's see if they do it. Did that blue player come out of the zone? No. So they get blown up. And it's uh, there's also there's another blue player still in there as well. You can actually see two of them. There's this one here. And one over here who hasn't got out as well. Puck's coming. Now, the puck can go in before the players do, but all of the players have to come out before any player can go back in. Hear the whistle, hopefully. Oops. So, so the whistle's not blown as soon as the puck crosses the blue line. Oh. It's once a player gets to it. Yes. Okay. That player might be, might be getting out of the zone. You can, you can, it's called a delayed offside. You don't have to leave, the, like, you can't teleport. You can't get out of the zone instantly. As long as you are getting out of the zone, that's okay. It's if you don't get out of the zone, that's when it becomes a problem, or if you play the puck. So if you play the puck when you're offside, or you don't get out of the zone and you continue to apply pressure to the other team, then you'll get done for offside. Basically, if the puck comes out, you have to get out directly. Okay. Again, it'll, it'll make a bit more sense. I'll show you another example of it. Uh, just one more, because again, it does it does tend to be a bit of an issue. Let's see what happens in this video. All right. So what's happening at the moment? Uh, blue team's defending. Yep. They've got the puck. Green team's attacking. Let's see what happens. Blue's cleared the puck out of the zone. Can you see it? Might be a bit hard to see. It's up here in the top right-hand corner. But the puck has come past that blue line. That's this before we repainted the lines. Which means all of the green players are in there all offside, aren't they? Mm. One of them gets out. One of them here. What's he doing? Still like skating towards the... He, wasn't to the he hadn't realized he was offside. Because he wasn't making his way directly out, he was he's, that's considered being part of the play. And so as a result, um, he was offside. And that the play also had also come in up here in the top right hand corner. So for two reasons, that was an offside. It, can, it looks a little bit complicated at the moment. If you're not sure what all this means, it's actually a bit simpler than, than it kind of looks at the moment. Basically, if the puck comes out of the zone, everyone has to leave before anyone can come back in. And as long as you just remember that and also listen to that, if your coach yelling out, offside, 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 <laughs> that means it's you, get out. So you've got to be listening. All right. Hopefully that's got most of it. Back to this one. Back to icing. Okay, so icing is a rule that's designed to prevent you in defence from getting the puck and just dumping it all the way down the other end, which is a nice thing to do because it takes the pressure off you. You can go and get a change, um, get new fresh legs on the ice, all that sort of stuff. Happy times, no big deal. Just dump the puck all the way down the other end. Wouldn't that be nice if you could do it all the time? <laughs> B 
but you can't. The attacking team has to have some sort of an advantage from putting you under the sort of pressure. So the idea is if you shoot the puck down the other end from behind the middle line and it crosses the far far end, then that's in an icing situation. And the referee will put their hand up in the end, in the air. They may say icing. They don't have to, but they will extend their hand up in the air. Some refs will say icing, others won't. Uh, in addition, your teammates may yell out icing. Your coach may yell out icing. Something like that. Uh, and we're not allowed to go and put pressure on the opposition player until they have recognisable control of the puck. If you're killing a penalty, it doesn't apply. So if one of your players is, is sitting in the penalty box for two minutes for some infraction, you are allowed to dump the puck all the way down the other end and there is no icing on that. Um, players at the other end are required to play the puck. You're not allowed to stand there next to it and kind of look at it saying, I'm not going to play it so it doesn't wipe the icing. Uh, you are required to play it or, you, or, you, or you're delaying the game. And there was that little video of a little bit earlier. Penalties. <laughs> if you've been naughty, you get two minutes. Um, you, uh, that's a minor offence, something like an accidental high stick or tripping someone up. Tripping's a funny one because they, the referees have no discretion. If your stick trips someone over, whether you meant it or not, you're getting two minutes. Don't argue with the refs about it. Whether or not you think what they saw happened is what happened, it doesn't matter. The referees decide reality. We're just interested spectators. So just deal with it. And has anyone played any sport where referees change their mind because someone's argued with them? Doesn't happen, does it? Definitely not. <laughs> so don't argue with referees. If they see something and you're absolutely 100% convinced they're wrong, you're wrong. That's just how it is. They're the ones who interpret situations. There's nothing you can do about it. If you say, I'm going to look at the video afterwards, that's nice, but it's all over by then. Don't waste your time. If there's something that happens on the ice that you're unhappy about, don't argue with the ref. Tell me about it. And I'll do my best to try and sort it out if there's something that needs to be sorted out or explained. But don't escalate to referees. It simply is not worth anything. You'll, you'll get extended time. You'll get 10 minutes for arguing referees. You may get a game misconduct, which means you get kicked out of the rink if you do that sort of stuff. And if you persist on doing it, we'll kick you out of our program as well. Um, we won't tolerate people arguing with referees or disrespecting referees or officials. We simply won't. We have zero tolerance towards it. Um, so, yeah, don't argue with the refs. Okay. If you do get sent out for some reason, not even allowed to go to the bench, you have to leave the rink by, by way of the change rooms, get changed and leave the rink if it happens. It's pretty rare. I don't think it's ever happened in C2. Um, most people tend to be pretty well behaved. But every now and then you get some hothead who goes a bit stupid. Um, don't be that hothead. Don't go a bit stupid. Uh, if you want to know where all the rules are coming from, they are coming from the International Ice Hockey Federation's rulebook, which you can download and read. Uh, I think I mentioned earlier, you, you're trying to put yourself to sleep. It's a good way to do it. It's it's really not very exciting. Uh, there are some bits that are quite amazing. All the different rules about fighting and stuff like that are quite entertaining when you start reading through them. It's like, really? Uh, bear in mind that the IHQ Beer League's icing rule is different. Uh, and all of the rules about appeals and so forth, about tribunals and stuff, they're all very different. There is no tribunal at IceHQ. We do have video review. If the referees or Ross, the rink owner, or Ryan, the beer league com com commissioner, see something, they will look at it on the videos. Everything that happens on the rink is videoed, uh, and they may decide to have a chat with you, and people do get suspended um, for various infractions usually revolving around unsportsmanlike behaviour. So if you go whacking someone with a stick or kicking someone or something like that, you, you're going to get a holiday, uh, and, and as you should. Um, so we do have variations from those rules. But again, if you want to read through the, the International Ice Hockey Federation rulebook, it's worth having a read through. Again, it's different to the NHL rules in some subtle ways, in particular around face-offs, but we don't need to worry about that. It's a bit technical, um, but there's a link to it. it does, that link does change. That link is current at the moment, but tomorrow it might be different. Um, but you can always just Google it. It's pretty easy to find. Okay. Any, more, any questions about those rules? Because we're about to move on to safety. Uh, no, no, all good. All 100% perfect. We're never going to get done for icing or offside. <laughs> we'll try. <laughs> it's going to happen. Don't worry. It's what we're there for. We're like, oh, C2, bless them. <laughs> but it happens in every grade. All right. So, safety. The hardest thing on the ice is the ice. We are playing a game on a surface which is arguably harder than concrete, surrounded by barriers, surrounded by a glass wall. 
The soft thing is us. The breakable thing is us. We have blades on our feet and we have a weapon in our hands. We have to be careful. Right? I, I cannot stress this enough how important it is that we are careful with what we do. Um, you guys don't have the skills to avoid a lot of collisions. So we want to make sure that we don't put ourselves in positions where it can happen. Um, don't ever kick or push someone with your feet. You've got blades on the end of your feet. They are extraordinarily dangerous. They are sharp. People have had severed arteries, not at Ice HQ, but it certainly has happened. Uh, there was an incident in an NHL game not that long ago where I think it was Subban. I can't remember who it was. One of the one of the elite players copped the skate across the arm and that severed an artery. Okay, It can happen. Um, so we need to be very careful, in particular with our feet. Do not kick someone in circumstances. Keep your feet down. Keep them on the ice. Uh, don't deliberately swing your stick at someone. Again, they're very, very dangerous. You might not realise how much damage you can do with a stick, but you can do a lot of damage with a stick very, very, very quickly. Okay, so don't use your stick as a weapon. Um, don't intentionally trip someone. It's bloody dangerous, right? People can break arms, legs, necks. Okay, uh, sometimes it happens by mistake, and that's just part of the game. Um, I don't know, I've knocked plenty of people over in my time without intending to do so, uh, but don't ever do it deliberately. It doesn't mean you can't run into people, but we're not trying to knock them off their feet. Um, we're all beginners, you're all a bit unstable, so be careful with what you do. And if you're not sure, back off a little bit. I'm going to show you a video now, and this is from an incident that happened in a game about 18 months ago. Just bear with me for a second while I share it. What happened? Was that just like a little little shove on the way to contest the puck? Um, I think what happened is the um, the Honey Badgers player, the, the tall the tall bloke, uh, ran. The, the, the girl who fell over, that's Naomi Conway, uh, and she's just starting up playing again this season. She ended up with a broken tibia and fibula, uh, so a compound break, um, in the gap between the two major COVID lockdowns. Uh, and so she spent the vast majority of lockdown in the hospital having surgery, having her leg repaired. Um, she got hit from behind, not, not so much hit. The guy was chasing after her and hit the back of her leg with his knee by the look of it. I'm 95, 99% sure it wasn't intentional. He probably didn't intend to run into her. But what happens when you're skating towards the boards and you're not sure that you can stop? The they boards are going to win. But also you start to slow down, don't you? So yes. if we go back to the start of this video, I want you to watch. So Naomi's there on the right hand in the middle of the screen. Watch how she turns. Is that the most elegant of turns you've ever seen? No. No. So you can tell straight away, she's not the best skater in the world, yeah? which should tell you something about how you've got to approach 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 that situation. So if you're skating towards the boards, that's where the impact happens. It knocks her feet out from underneath her and she goes feet first into the boards and has a compound fracture of the lower leg. Misses 18 months of hockey. All right. Be careful. While that wasn't that player's fault who ran into the back of her, shouldn't have been there. All right, that's one of those situations where if you're skating up behind someone and you think, I'm going for the puck, I'm going to contest this, just think a little bit about it and think, hang on a sec, what happens if I knock that player's feet out from underneath them and they break a leg or worse, they're breaking neck? Okay, we've got to treat our, treat our, our opponents with respect and safety. Don't try and break someone's leg. Don't, don't, basically, don't try and knock someone over. Uh, and be careful as, as you get close to the boards that you treat, give them a bit of distance. It's not worth it. It's a bit different if it's higher level. Someone might be skating in and they're going to stop at the boards or something like that. But at this level, people slow down. They're not sure. Give them some space. Or well, you do risk a pretty serious injury. 
And in that case, it was a very serious injury. And he was very unwell and she ended up in hospital catching COVID. So <laughs> it wasn't fun for her. I can tell you that much for free. So if in doubt, back off. Um, good habits. Keep your stick on the ice. We don't want you pitchforking. Uh, that video from a little bit earlier where you saw Lisa Mack get hit in the face by a guy with a stick, it's because he was holding it in both hands while he was turning. And as his shoulders swung, the stick comes up. You don't know who's behind you. You might whack someone in the face. So sticking one hand down on the ice or both hands down on the ice as much as possible. Um, well, there's also a, a requirement that you stay on your feet. This is a unique rule in C grade. We introduced this about a third of the way through last season. And I will show you why we made this rule. Here's the video here. I think. Oh, I'm going over here. Um, anyway, if you deliberately leave your feet, like diving for a puck or diving to get in the way, you will be penalised. So stay on your feet. It's different in the high grade. In high grades, you're allowed to dive, but in this grade, we we require that you stay on your feet. If you fall over, you're not going to get penalised. But if you deliberately leave your leave your feet, and it's pretty obvious when you do, um, you'll get penalised. Carl, is taking one knee considered leaving your feet? No. Okay. So you can block a shot if you want. Um, yeah, that's that was what I was getting at. Yeah. The only time you do it, but yeah, if you deliberately dive and, and leave it, leave your feet, like say for example, someone's away from and you dive at full length and hold your stick out to try and try and get to the puck or something like that, uh, you'll get penalised for it. Um, not in the higher leagues unless you actually actually, actually trip someone, but at this level, we've basically made it made it illegal across the board. So if you leave your feet, you'll get penalised. Uh, it's because there was a couple of players who were getting a bit out of control with it. Uh, and they're basically turning themselves into human bowling balls uh, and skittling people. And it's one thing to have your legs knocked out from underneath you and slide feet first into the board, feet first into the boards, but imagine you went head first into the boards. Who wants to spend the rest of their life in a wheelchair? Okay, stay on your feet. <laughs> um, they're skating behind someone being careful near the boards you've just seen the video there of Naomi keep the gate closed um, we'll normally have that looked after for you but keeping the gate closed is important if you're skating along behind beside it and you get it and you get nudged into it again you can cause an injury um, we also want to make sure that you're looking up and looking where you're going I'm going to show you another video you can see an example of that should we have it here Please tell me I've got it here. There we go. That's the one. This is a, a collision that resulted in a concussion. And these days we're much more concussion aware than we ever used to be. And a high stick. <laughs> Uh, we'll watch it again, and you can see at that point, two players legitimately contesting the puck, yeah? Yep. Uh, yes. Nothing wrong with that at all. Um, the player in the green's got his head up. The player in the red has his head down, and all he's doing is watching the puck. Green guy gets it and stops. Guy in the red with his head down, not even looking anywhere else except the puck. And it's understandable, skate straight into him head first. And I don't think he knocked himself out, but he certainly knocked himself silly for a little while uh, and got a, got a decent concussion out of it. Now, there's a bunch of things going on there. One of them is there's a difference in size between people. Those of us who are a bit bigger, we need to look after the people who are a bit smaller and try not to clean them up. It is easy to do. Um, so we have a responsibility to use our size wisely which is to say, try not to turn ourselves into human battering rams. It's easy to do. Um, I know I used to play non play non-checking grade way back, way back in the 1990s, and I spent a lot of time in the penalty box just because I won crashes because I was 110 kilos and didn't fall over very easily. So we need to make sure that where possible, we look after the smaller people on the rink and try not to you know, get in their way too much. Doesn't mean you have to avoid contact, but just be careful about it. Um, 
But yeah, you've also got to look where you're going. If you're not looking where you're going, it's it's going to end badly for you, which basically means skating control. Chasing after the puck at a million miles an hour when you're not sure where you're going is a recipe to get hurt. So skate within your ability, play within your abilities to skate and have a vision of what, about what you're doing. It's probably the most important principle to be aware of. Um, fortunately, that, that player's all right. It wasn't long-term injury, but it was, you know, he wasn't very happy at the time. Always give your opposition the benefit of the doubt as well. If there's a crash, if you run into each other, if you get whacked with a stick, you get tripped, you think someone shoved an elbow in your face or anything like that, 99.9% .9 of the time, they didn't mean to hurt you. They just C2 beginners and they're flailing around because that's what happens in C2. If someone whacks you in the head with a stick in A grade, they meant it. If someone whacks you in the, stick with a, in, in the head with a stick in C2, it's an accident. So make sure you give them the benefit of the doubt. Do not escalate. Um, we will deal with anything if it is untowards because we're seeing it, we watch it. So if anything does happen that shouldn't happen, talk to myself or Neil about it, not to the referees, and certainly don't escalate anything on the rink because it will continue. We always brief about this before the start of every game as well because it's the number one concern for us is that we play as good sports and we don't escalate things. Um, just assume it was an accident, no matter what, because 99.9% .9 of the time is. Um, anyone who does anything deliberately unsafe in our squad will be removed from the squad, and I will not hesitate to do it. Um, we won't tolerate anyone deliberately endangering the safety, the safety of someone else. Accidents happen, we get it, but if you do it deliberately, if you deliberately line someone up to hurt them, or deliberately whack someone with a stick intending to hurt them, or kick them or anything like that, we will remove you from the squad. Okay, that'll be it. No more hockey for you. Um, and that's more strict than the rink would do. The rink might give you a holiday. We'll we'll kick you out of the squad. Go find another team. Um, so be aware of that. <laughs> Make sure you play play nicely with others. It's, there's not a lot of things that could get you removed from the squad. That's about it. Sort of bad sports behaviour will get you removed. I'm sorry to have to wave the right right act, but it's one of those things that I kind of have to do every now and then. Is just kind of remind everyone that we have zero tolerance for that sort of thing. C grade Ice HQ rules. We have the stay on your feet rule, which is unique to C grade at Ice HQ. Do not leave your feet. Do not dive. Um, icing is different for C grade. I think I've discussed that now and hopefully it makes sense. They did change the rules for B grade and A grade. Um, but for C grade, you can the game basically continues. It'll make more sense once we actually start playing. But uh, the icing doesn't stop the game. It doesn't mean you can't get a change uh, in C grade. Um, no slap shots. You're not allowed to wind up with your stick above your knee, which very rarely is a problem. Some field hockey players who've actually got a half decent decent shot, or if you've come from a background of playing inline, uh, sometimes you can have a slap shot. Don't use it in C grade because uh, I don't know that you'll get penalised for it. Um, but certainly the game will get stopped, and there'll be a face off, and you can't score a goal from it. Uh, there's a really good safety reason for that. A lot of people can't um, aren't aware of where the puck is a lot of the time. Uh, and so if you go firing rockets in at the goals, you might score someone in the back who's who's not aware of it and would cause injury. That's the main reason for it. And from a practical perspective as well, um, most slap shots aren't terribly effective anyway. You're better off doing a wrist shot. Um, so I wouldn't particularly waste my time with a slappy anyway, even if you were allowed to do it. Um, and keep it real and have fun. Um, you know, it's a recreational grade. I hate to disappoint you, but the NHL talent scouts, talent scouts are not at our rink watching everyone to see who's going to you know, make it to the show next week. It doesn't work like that. Um, your adult beginners, keep it real. Every game you approach it with a mindset of I'm here to have fun and learn and improve uh, and to respect my opponents uh, and not, um, not uh, go there to cause conflict, but to, to enjoy the game. That's why we're all there. And we're all paying for the privilege. And it better be fun. Otherwise, why are you doing it? That's about it. Wow. One hour and two minutes. Not too bad. <laughs> Questions? Just with that, like, stay on your feet. Um, if you happen to fall over, um, can you still kind of try and play the puck if you're near it? Yes, you can. Yep. You're just not allowed to do it deliberately. 
And it's obvious when you do. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think I'll do a sneaky dive. It's like, no, nah, we can tell. It's pretty yeah. obvious. <laughs> um, but yeah, you, if you you don't have to stop playing when you're when you're on the ground. Um, you, in in the defensive zone, you're even allowed to have you're even allowed to do a hand, what's called a hand pass. Um, so if you're in your own defensive third, you're allowed to catch the puck and throw it. You have to throw it immediately. You can't carry it. Uh, if you're in any other part of the rink, you're allowed to catch it, catch it, but then you have to immediately drop it. Ten, sorry, throw it. Yep, in your defensive zone, you can throw it. Throw so it. You, can, you can do a hand pass. Yep, in your defensive zone. Oh, not okay. anywhere else, but you can in your defensive zone. Um, if you do it in the offensive or the neutral zone, you get penalised for it. Um, but you are allowed to hand pass in your defensive zone. Is is that real rules or is that C two uh, rules? That's real rules across the everywhere, everywhere. NHL, um, International Ice Hockey Federation, the whole lot. No shit. I thought it was just you, you caught the puck, you put it straight at your feet. You can't throw it as a pass you anywhere. Can throw it. You're not allowed to carry it, but you can throw it. Wow. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> it's harder than you think. Uh, you might think, oh, great. Well, I'm just going to you know, leave my puck behind, grab the puck, and you know, catching it, throwing it. Well, for starters, um, I don't know if you've ever caught a puck before. I I've got it some hurts. different bruises from it, and I know people who've split fingers. Um, <laughs> it's, it's not such a good idea anyway. But what it does mean, for example, if you're on the ground, say, for example, it's a board battle or something, and the puck's on the ground, you can put your hand on top of it and then flick it and, and throw it out as a defensive player. You can't do that in attack, but you can do it in defense. So in that context, it's potentially useful. But what would you have to be careful of? Skates and sticks. sticks. Yeah, skates and sticks, absolutely. You've got your hands. And okay, you've got pretty decent gloves on, but who knows what, you, what your um, elbow guards are like. The, the, the CCM AS5 Pros are pretty solid, but some of the more basic entry-level ones, they're not going to protect you if someone jumps on you with a skate. And they won't mean it. They're just trying to kick the puck because you're allowed to kick the puck. Not allowed to kick the player, but you can kick the puck. <laughs> if someone's hands down there and you're not even aware of the fact that it's there, you're not doing it deliberately. It's like, oh, whoops. <laughs> Off to the first aid for you, and let's see if we can stop that blood coming out. So you can, but be careful. Anything else? There's lots of other rules, but we've only sort of touched on, on the main ones that we see at the very start. Um, another one about changes often gets people. Um, you're not allowed to change unless the person you're changing with is within a metre and a half of the boards and they're in the process of getting off while you're in the process of getting on. Um, so don't change when someone's on the other side of the ring, which also means if you are coming for a change, don't don't dawdle, get there quickly. Speaking of changes, are you, how much of that are you going to be coordinating from the bench? To start with all of it. Okay, good. So for the first couple of games, we call pretty much the changes. As the season goes on, we take less and less responsibility for it and basically hand it over to you guys more. So by the time it gets to the end of the season, we're not calling changes at all. You're doing it all yourselves. But it's you, you can kind of consider probably the first three or four games to be a training session with live opposition. It's the best way to put it. Yeah, gotcha. It's the same for everyone because all the teams are full of beginners. Um, half of them have never played before. And it usually takes four to six weeks for it all to start making sense to most people. And that's when we notice you can kind of, it's, it's a really handy thing for you to do as, as players coming through this program, is all, all the games are video, is go back after sort of like game five or game six and go back and watch game one. <laughs> You're like, oh, we were terrible, weren't we? Yes, yes, you were. <laughs> <laughs> but now look at where you are. You know, because you'll because it'll start to make sense. It'll start to gel, and you'll actually start playing a game of hockey as opposed to skating around like a bunch of five year olds playing soccer. Everyone chasing the puck um, and forgetting to change and all those sorts of things. So it, 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 there is a noticeable improvement usually between about game four and game six for most most teams. All right, seems to be about it. Um, I'll shut down the recording. This will be stuck up onto YouTube and I will email the link out through to all of the people on the Hazy's and Mac Daddy's bench app. I'll also put the link up in the Adult Dev Squad Facebook group. So anyone who wants it wants to watch it can at their leisure. Uh, hopefully it's been useful. 
Um, this is, I think, the second time we've done this. We're trying to get as much into your heads before game one as we possibly can without trying to overload you. Um, there will be a fairly comprehensive briefing before the first game in the change rooms as well. So make sure if you're borrowing gear, you're there an hour early. If you've got your own gear, that you're there probably half to three quarters of an hour before the start of the game, so you've got time to get changed. Be aware too that if you're playing in the second game on Friday night, it is bookending the two games are bookending the, the pro league games. Um, so Neil will be helping you get ready for the second game because I'm involved in the commentary for the pro league. Um, so Neil will be helping you there in terms of just going to getting everything organized and getting ready. Um, and so yeah, give him a bit of slack. <laughs> he hasn't done it before yet. Um, and yeah, and come along and watch the pro league too. It's the, one of the great things about it is that you will start to notice the patterns that, that, that we're teaching you, they're doing as well. Uh, they're doing them better, um, but they're, they're basically doing the same patterns that we're, we're teaching you. They're copying us, of course, not the other way around. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, so it's, it's really handy to watch higher levels of hockey and, and see what patterns and structures they use, or indeed what, what mistakes they're making. It's quite handy too. Uh, so immerse yourselves in it as much as you can. Get to hockey school, do the Wednesday night classes, Get along with public sessions and skate as much as you possibly can. The more you skate, the better. Uh, even if it's just going to a rink and skating around around in circles for a couple of hours, just get on your skates, skate as much as you can. It all helps. All righty. I will see all of you on Friday. Thanks, Coach. Thanks, Carl. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Carl. You. Thanks. Thank you.